Pac-Man is the first thing you need to know about program control. I'm solidly Generation X, born in 1973, and I've always loved video games. As a young person in the early 1980s, when the video arcade was basically a sacred temple for any 10-year-old, I was in those arcades when my brain was still forming early ideas and concepts. I'm not saying that this is optimal or even normal, or that I had responsible parents but it's some background for what happens next. Just a little refresher for those who did not get dropped off by a parent at the arcade in the morning and picked up later at night. No cell phones, no supervision, 1981. In Pac-Man, you're a small yellow disc hungry for dots. Eat all of the dots to clear the board. Four unique ghosts get in your way, eat one of the power pellets at the four corners of the screen, and you can turn the tables on those ghosts, gobble them up, score points, and clear the board. Every time you do clear the screen, you're presented with a new screen, and the process starts once again, increasing in difficulty as you progress through the game. Inevitably, the game will overcome your skills, and the goal of the developer was for you to have fun and to get you hooked so you would drop another quarter and try again. I first played the game at an ice skating arena in New Jersey, and although my game lasted merely just a few seconds on that first try, I was hooked for life. In my home in 2022 is one Pac-Man machine, and another that can play Pac-Man in many other games, and this one too, and this other good stuff. So when I say I was hooked, I'm not around here. Let's talk about some key qualities of Pac-Man, and how I found that it can relate heavily and directly to program control, and what better way to kick off this free program control training series by correlating program control to Pac-Man. So let's dig in. On the surface, you're controlling Pac-Man and all of these ghosts are trying to defeat you. One thing you learn quickly when playing is that the ghosts have different personalities. Blinky, in fabulous red, is almost always making a beeline for you. They're very fast, and they constantly try to run you down. Pinky is clever, and tries to anticipate where you'll be, and tries to ambush you. Inky uses your position and Blinky's position to determine their path, often resulting in an ambush like this one. Finally, Clyde does a few different things, and always seems to end up between you and your precious power pellet. You do have some unique advantages in the game. Even novice players can quickly learn that you turn corners faster than the ghosts, and those ghosts are scared of the tunnels slowing down when they pass through them while you go full speed. If you add it all up, Pac-Man can be a surprisingly complex game, but keep in mind it's only 24 kilobytes in size. One single still frame from this video right now takes up more computer memory than the entirety of Pac-Man and actually the whole rest of an 80s arcade put together. If you think about what the developers accomplished with so little, it's just incredible, even decades later. But what this also means is that if you dissect the game, look at the ghost behavior individually, how the scoring works, how the maze is always the same construct, the individual elements are actually quite simple. After all, it did need to fit into those 24 kilobytes. And one huge fact about the game is that there's no true randomness at all. If we hooked up one single controller to 50 independent Pac-Man machines, you could actually play all 50 at once and your result on all 50 would be identical to the one screen you were looking at. Pac-Man is deterministic. This was changed on Ms. Pac-Man and other variants, but again, the original uses no randomness at all. This allows for patterns where the same moves, modified for the increasing difficulty of the game as you go, can take you all the way to the eventual delightfully buggy kill screen that can't be cleared without some system hacks. Now, I don't do patterns. That takes all the fun and anticipation away. Back to this deterministic aspect of the game, though, and this is a big deal to me, and, the, and it's the reason for this video. Because the behaviors of the ghosts are based on Pac-Man's movements entirely, and you are completely in control of Pac-Man, you are actually controlling not only Pac-Man, but all of the ghosts in the maze simultaneously all the time. Louder for those in the back. Because the behaviors of the ghosts are based on Pac-Man's movements entirely, and you are completely in control of Pac-Man, you are actually controlling not only Pac-Man, but all of the ghosts in the maze simultaneously 
all the time. You are in full control of the things that are trying to kill you. Half of you now think that I'm both wrong about that and also insane. And the other half will progressively start to agree with the first half. I agree that you are more directly controlling Pac-Man, north, south, east, west, within the confines of the maze. Every action from you, though, has reaction from the ghosts, and it's 100% consistent all based entirely on your chosen position in the maze and the direction that you're pushing on the joystick, that's it. Even when they all change direction at one time, which they do, it's based on a fixed timer. I even find myself subconsciously counting through that timer in my head so that I know just about when the ghosts are going to instantly reverse their course and I use that to my advantage. Even when you eat a power pellet and they try to skitter off, they make seemingly random moves, but it's the same random seed value every single time you start a game, across all games. If you're a programmer, you know how all that works. In short, the game is not random, but where the ghosts all go and how they move, again, are directly and entirely controlled and affected by where you are and where you're going the same way every time. Now, don't tell someone while they're playing the game that they're fully in control of everything going on. They'll disagree with you. They will insist that you're wrong. They'll say, if I were, then I would not lose all the time. But just like in program control, building that schedule, engaging with the engineers, tracking down people for signatures on change orders, reporting to the customer in Pac-Man, if you break down the key elements and really study them in practice, you get better and better. You might even find yourself creatively wrangling all those ghosts in the line, all of them trying to, vying to be the one that brings you down. But because you're in the process of mastering the game, you've lured them into your world under your control, eat the pellet, and now they're lined up to your advantage. And then they come back ready for another go, but by then maybe you've cleared the screen. Then it starts over and they're faster, they fade to blue for less and less time, and eventually they'll get you, and then you'll drop another quarter, take your new experience, and try once again. Okay, Tom, <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> I've been waking up five to seven days a week and working for about 30 years now. I've worked with some awesome people like you and you and you and even you over there. But sometimes combinations of circumstances or ghosts really bring me down. Sometimes I'm ready to throw my hands up and say, I can't do it. I've lost control of the situation, the problem, the project, the plan, or some other anxiety or disappointment. At work, I sometimes literally would say, they got me this time. We failed the audit. Something else happened that didn't go as expected and ah. Uh... <laughs> but then I think back, each board, each problem, each dilemma in program control. It's just the maze where you gobble the pellets, eat some fruit, occasionally you eat a key. And I say to myself, you control these ghosts these problems, these processes, while you only directly control yourself, everything you do has a direct impact on those nuances and gremlins. And like in Pac-Man, you have your own unique advantages. You can choose to corral these problems together or even just face them one at a time. And the more times you fail, the more you've learned about what you can do better next time. You could wait and let events play out. There's a time for that. Or you can navigate that maze proactively with grace, style, and experience, win the day, and then I promise you'll be greeted with that next board or challenge where everything's a little faster and more difficult, but you'll be better equipped each and every time. Lately, I've heard a term more and more, gamification of processes, even uh, in context of processes and program control. Gamification's intent is to engage people. And if it's the right processes and engagement increases, that should improve execution and profitability of your projects. I think though what people are missing about this new trend of gamification is that it's really always been there. You've always had the ability to plan, do, study, act, and react, whether it's a video game or that next real world challenge. The game of life and work has always been there. The key elements ripe for inspection, introspection, and review. 
so that you can plan your next moves, see how they work, and get better and better at what you do. If you take one thing away from this weird video, <laughs> it's to stop and think next time you're in that challenging situation where you feel like you don't have any control over it. Could be that growing list of project risks, that bow wave, that forecast that's just run completely out of control. Break it down. Look at those ghosts. Eat an apple or a key and think, am I really not in control of this situation? Or if I peel it back, is everything around me ripe for my own influence and control? Even indirectly sometimes, whether that's introducing new soft skills, new processes, or something else entirely. I just need to break it down into pieces, give it my best, use my unique advantages as Pac-Man would, maybe take some lumps, but be more prepared each time to take another shot, learn from the mistakes, and clear the board. That's the goal of this training series. Tune in very soon for the first module. I'll let you know when it's up. This series is not about which buttons to push on your computer. There's plenty of training for that. In my opinion, the missing piece on program control training to date is the art and style of engaging with project teams in order to promote the team's unique advantages with the end goal of winning the game, getting the project executed, with grace and style, solve the odd challenges, and do even better on the next one. This training is and always will be completely free, and the goal is to help you do your best in your program control endeavors.